It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening. This is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. James H.R. Cromwell, former United States Minister to Canada. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Joseph R. Farrington, delegate to Congress from the Territory of Hawaii. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Mr. Farrington, about two million Americans, I believe, uh, traveled through Hawaii during the Second War, and met most of our viewers tonight uh, hope to go to Hawaii at some time during their lifetime, so it's a great pleasure to have you with us tonight, sir. Now, uh, what word can you give all of our viewers who have been to Hawaii and those who do want to go? Uh, how is business generally in the islands now? Business in Hawaii is very good. Are you uh, prospering on a uh, defense economy there now? The expenditures for national defense since the uh, outbreak of the Korean War uh, have been increased uh, substantially, and we have prospered uh, as a result of that. And I'd like to say also, for, for particularly for the benefit of those who have been to uh, Hawaii that there's been a heavy increase in tourist travel and that conditions there are much more attractive for the tourists now than they were of course during the war. Now is the is the military is still uh, your bread and butter in Hawaii? It's still your number one source of income I assume? Well it's the source of largest income at the present time although uh, uh, we don't regard it as the base of our economy by any means. And where does uh, sugar and pineapple and tourists, how do they rank behind the military? The basic industry of Hawaii is uh, sh the raising of sugar cane. We produce about a million tons of raw sugar a year. Uh, some approximately 25% of the sugar produced under the American flag. The next uh, product is pineapples. And we produce about 85 to 90% of all the pineapples consumed by the people of this country. The third is the tourist industry. And have you any new hotels out there built since the Yes, war? we have. We have uh, several very fine new hotels. Uh, one in particular, the Surf Rider, is uh, just in front of the famous Waikiki Beach Surf. Have you a housing shortage out there at the present time? Well, we've had a housing shortage, as a matter of fact, since uh, uh, the beginning of the emergency before World War II. Uh and uh, it still exists. I believe your, <coughs> your, your labor troubles out there have made a great many headlines in the United States. Are you still uh, vexed with labor troubles? Is that one of your difficulties now? Yes, that's very true, but I don't think uh, uh, much more so than the rest of the country. Uh, I'd like to uh, point out that uh, in Hawaii, uh, uh, organized labor as such uh, wasn't established as an effective economic force until after World War II. And today, with, in respect particularly to our basic industries, we're much in the same phase as uh, coal was way back in 1912, as steel was in about 1919, as automobiles were in about 1930. The uh, most militant of unions uh, was established the labor movement in Hawaii as an effective force, and they still maintain that uh, leadership. Do you think they're more left-wing in Hawaii than would be the case in the United States, comparatively well, principle, speaking? That's, uh, that's true of the, of the largest and principal union in Hawaii. It's the International Longshoremen, Longshoremen's and Warehousemen's Union, and it is regarded as being among the principal left-wing unions of the country. That's the one that's under the leadership of Mr. Bridges? That's correct. Well, is it true to say that you are, the, your whole economy is more or less at the mercy of Mr. Harry Bridges? Well, I don't uh, contend that our economy is at the mercy of, of Harry Bridges. 
Uh, our economy is at the, the, the uh, is subject to the geographical conditions that, uh, that maintain in Hawaii. We're isolated from the coast by 2,400 miles of water, and unless the shipping lanes are maintained open, we just can't live. And that means that you're at the mercy of the shipping unions. Well, uh, we're at the mercy of the shipping unions or of an administration that's unwilling to keep the ships sailing. And now, uh, while the shipping unions have gained power over you, sir, does that mean that uh, your traditional uh, Big Five has lost economic power in Hawaii and political power? Well, for a long period of time, the, uh, the Big Five, who uh, are generally represented as the factors who uh, uh, operate the sugar uh, industry constituted the dominating economic and political And they were more or less uh, Bostonians, uh, New England people, were they not, the Big Five? The, uh, the, the basis of our uh, political, social, and economic life was established by the missionaries who went to uh, Hawaii from Boston in 1820 and developed our industry much in the pattern of the American tradition. Hawaii has been accused, you know, in the articles that I've read Mr. Farrington being somewhat of a feudal state under the guidance of this big five, so-called. Do you think that's still true? No, I don't. If it ever was a feudalism, it was a very benevolent uh, feudalism and very much in the American uh, pattern. But well, I think that the diversification of their strength and power has taken, uh, has taken care of that in the last of course, the principal aspiration of Hawaii now is to become a state, isn't it? That's correct. And uh, as far as statehood is concerned, you don't expect it to be granted this year? No, I, uh, I uh, doubt if the Senate uh, will uh, take action on the statehood before it adjourns this summer. Do you is there opposition to statehood in Hawaii itself? There is opposition to statehood in Hawaii, but it comes from a dwindling minority. Our viewers, of course, have heard senators like Senator Stennis of Mississippi and others state why they are opposed to statehood for Hawaii, principally because of dilution of the Congress. Uh, is that where most of the opposition in Congress comes from, from Southern senators? Yes, the principal and the most serious opposition comes from the, uh, uh, the senators from the South who want to maintain the traditional position of the South with respect to certain types of legislation. Under the present rules of the Senate, which permit unlimited debate, uh, they have uh, what amounts to uh, the power to veto legislation to which they uh, have uh, very serious objections. Now, Mr. What Fa pardon me. Mr. Farrington, uh, I had one senator tell me that he was opposed to statehood for Hawaii because maybe we might have an Oriental senator. What do you think of that? Is that a possibility? And what do you think of it if it is a possibility? I want to answer that by saying that no one will represent Hawaiian Congress who, first of all, is not an American citizen. And I don't think it is uh, uh, proper to raise any questions regarding their uh, ancestral background any more than it is to do the same with the people of the states. What about loyalty to the United States? Did you, during the Second War, for instance, did you have any, uh, was disloyalty a great problem in Hawaii? No, it was not. And on the contrary, the record of Hawaii uh, uh, fully vindicated uh, the confidence uh, that we had in the Americans of Oriental ancestry. I want to say, in fur with further reference yes. to your question, Mr. Cromwell, that uh, that, of course, is within the realm of possibility, and we of Hawaii would not offer any uh, objection uh, to a man because of his race. Uh, I think that if uh, someone came along who met uh, the requirements of, the, of such a position, that uh, he would be selected. When I lived in Hawaii before the war, I encountered what I thought was a very remarkable situation there, and that was in the shape of these Japanese language schools. Do they still have those Japanese language schools? No, the Japanese language schools were discontinued uh, following the outbreak of World War, uh, World War II. They no longer exist. That's right. Now, uh, you, you were talking about the melting pot aspects of Hawaii, sir. So you've lived in Hawaii uh, most of your life, I That's believe. That's correct. And uh, 
I, it's rather dramatic, I think, this, uh, all of these races that do live together. Now, is it true that they live together successfully and that there is a cohesion in the islands? Do you have a more or less united people? I feel very definitely that uh, we have an unusually cohesive uh, people. One thing that distinguishes uh, uh, people of Hawaii with regard, without regard to their racial origin is their love for Hawaii, which to them is the United States. They love the uh, country geographically and every other way and are deeply uh, devoted. Is to communism to a problem there? Yes, communism is a problem in Hawaii, but I don't think any more so than it is elsewhere. I think to compensate for that, there's an unusual alertness of the seriousness of communism, both as it presents itself internationally and nationally. Do you think statehood would strengthen our defense position in the islands? I'm certain that it would uh, strengthen our defense position because statehood uh, historically has stimulated the economic uh, development of every uh, co community or area to which it has granted. And it has also uh, inspired the people uh, to a sense of their responsibility and to activity as American citizens that uh, might not otherwise be realized. Well, Mr. Farrington, uh, as, a, as the principal <coughs> spokesman for Hawaii's aspirations, I'm sure that our audience has very much appreciated hearing your views tonight, and thank you, sir. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. James H. R. Cromwell. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Joseph R. Farrington, Delegate to Congress from the Territory of Hawaii. You know, buying a Longines watch is like having a watch made to your individual order. Longines has always recognized that the purchasers of Longines watches expect this degree of exclusiveness. And each year, Longines produces literally many hundreds of styles and models to meet every taste and every preference. And of each Longines watch, it can be said, this is the world's most honored watch, Longines. For Longines watches are made to a single high standard of excellence. The unique Longines standard that has won for Longines 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and highest honors for accuracy from the leading government observatories. The Longines watches, now at your jewelers, represent 86 years of fine watchmaking experience, unmatched for excellence of construction and beauty of appearance. And yet do you know that you can buy and own, or buy and proudly give a Longines watch for as little as 71.50? Longines, the world's most honored watch. Made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. Sold and serviced by 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display the emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is Frank Knight reminding you again that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. See it now on the CBS Television Network.